Hello and welcome back to Fourth Age Guides. In this episode, we are looking at the Chiefdom of Dunland, a faction that never met a problem it didn't try to solve by throwing more sticks at it. This faction has quite a few strengths. It has quite a few weaknesses as well, which always makes it for an interesting play style. And so in this video, we're going to cover those uh, by starting off with a battle against the Reunited Kingdom. This is a, uh, a faction you will be facing if you play as Dunland in the mid to late campaign, and they can be one of your most dangerous uh, enemies. So let's start the battle here. As we get that going, we will take a look at the different units. Now out front, uh, I've got basically most of the cavalry you can train as the Chieftain of Dunland. Your most common cavalry are going to be these, Dunlandish Horsemen. Very basic in a sense. You can tell they've got very low armor. They do have a shield. They've got throwing spears as well as spears for use in melee. That makes them more effective than you might suspect based on looks and stats alone. They can get out of range, they can um, uh, get, get a surprising amount of damage in with a charge, and so these are guys you want to take care of. Your other cavalry uh, is only available in a single province, Dunfreca, and these are riders of the Eisenmarch. They're a bit hardier, a bit better armor as you can tell. These would count probably as medium cavalry, uh, but they're the heaviest cav you can train, with the exception of a lone cavalry bodyguard unit uh, that we'll talk about a bit later in the video, which I didn't bring here today. On this flank, I've also set up four units of Wolf Hunters. These are one of my favorite looking units uh, in the mod, actually. These guys cause fear. They also have throwing spears, and they have these long uh, two-handed blades. Uh, they have war cry, and so what I tried to do was set up an ambush here, but you can see in a little bit, I'll be moving them off of, uh, of this wing back to the regular, uh, the, the, where the rest of my army is set up because the Reunited Kingdom is bringing all of its army straight up towards where my units were hidden, of course. So I didn't want them to be isolated and just cut down. Over here, I've got uh, three Dunlandish bowmen fronting my formation. Most of my other guys are hidden in the woods, and hiding in the woods is going to be a, a strength for this faction. Now that the cavalry is charging in, you'll see that we're throwing uh, a lot of spears here. Uh, we've got a front line of Dunlinish Axemen with Tribal Spearmen as well. All those unit types get throwing spears. And we're pushing in with another important unit for Dunland, Tribal Pikes. Now these guys are Cav Killers, but as you can tell they lack a shield, and so they're going to be very vulnerable in other types of melees, and even against range. So you want to hold back on them a little bit. On this wing, uh, we do have a unit of Axes of the Wolf. We'll be bringing these guys out in a little while to cut down the enemy general here who's going after my archers. This is a two-handed axe unit, war cry capable, and they are effective against armor. Not too many Dunlandish units are effective against armor. Well, actually, now that I say that, you have, I think, four. You've got Axes of the Wolf, who are now getting up to do their war cry. You've also got Dunlanding Hillmen, which are effective against armor. These are large, scary units with maces. They can also war cry, and they can crush armor with those maces. And your bodyguard unit over here, Chieftain's Guardsmen. Uh, is also actually good against armor. So you do have quite a few options there for taking out enemy armor, not to mention the javelins that you can throw um, and the fear effect, and so you've got a lot of things going on with this faction. So this battle devolves into quite a mess. Now I wanted to do a lot of the fighting under the trees here because Dunland does it, uh, get some advantages there. They are good at ambushing, so they can stay hidden for longer when enemy units approach them. Uh, and they also get combat bonuses in the woods. Just about every unit of Dunland gets a combat bonus in the woods. So you want to do your fighting when possible in the trees. And you also want to hide your units, again when possible, because of that morale shock. When, uh, when enemy units see a unit suddenly emerging from hiding, it does a, a little hit to their morale. And when those units are frightening, as are several of your units, again those Dunlanding Hillmen, and those very scary, intimidating looking wolf hunters, uh, that's going to be even more dangerous for them. So there goes the enemy general cut down by my axes over here, and that is going to be a blow to the morale of the enemy. And at this point, we're pouring in uh, the, the cavalry, the uh, pretty much every cav unit here. We're trying to just shock the enemy and get them all to rout. These king swordsmen are indeed wavering. We'll be cutting them down, and I'm sure they'll be routing very soon. But you can see that we're having a hard time making any substantial gains in the, the central part of the fight here. 
Part of that is because the Reunited Kingdom has some extremely strong units, even their base level militia here. Kingdom militia is the lowest level unit they can train. This is still a very strong unit, and it may take a while for you to work your way through them. But once we hit them from the side here, now that we've got these other units on the run, I think they will be routing fairly quickly. We'll get those, um, get those wolf hunters over there, and here go the king swordsmen, and there go the kingdom militia. There are some other knots of resistance, though, that we will have a hard time to pull apart. Uh, one of those is going to be these men-at-arms. You can see that they have shield walled up so that they are um, just harder to break. But we're getting all around them now, or will be fairly shortly. And so here come the wolf hunters to charge right in. And, uh, and we will be breaking them eventually. King Spearmen are another very tough unit. Typically, heavy infantry is what you want to send against these guys, and that's what we're doing, but it is taking a while to cut them down simply because of that armor. And then another difficulty is the archers. Here you can see the archers are actually going in against my Axes of the Wolf. So this is the guy that just cut down their, their enemy general, but they're losing heavily against these archers. That's because longbowmen for the Reunited Kingdom are actually a hybrid unit in a lot of ways. They're very heavily armored. They don't have shields, but they do have good melee skill and defense, so you're going to take a long time cutting through them. But with some cav charges to the rear, now we can uh, we can make that happen. All the units now are routing, but it's they're uh, they've got nowhere to run, so we actually have to cut them down. I'm speeding up the battle just to get to the end uh, uh, card here, so we can see how we did. And this is a heroic victory, but notice how few survivors we have left. Out of fairly even numbers, yes, we killed all of the enemy, but we also lost about half of our own units. So on the battle statistics, you can see that we did a lot of damage with those Chieftain's Guardsmen. With the Dunlendish Horsemen and the Riders of the Eisenmarch, they did well. I, again, I tried to group them up together and keep them away from the melee so we could keep getting charges in. Um, the Bowmen did not do uh, much damage at all. Uh, 18, 17, 4, I believe it is. Uh, so that's not a lot of damage. Again, they're going to really struggle against those heavy uh, armored reunited kingdom units. They're going to be much more effective against archers, uh, but in an infantry heavy battle like that, they're not going to have a lot of soft targets to hit. Other uh, notable uh, casualty inflictors were the Axes of the Wolf with 81, uh, the Hillmen with 96, and the Wolf Hunters made a, a, quid, uh, a pretty good showing themselves as well. Um, so let's go now to the, uh, the custom battle screen where we can look at some of Dunlin's units uh, and, and uh, see some things that we didn't see in that particular fight. So Dunlin has the, the ability to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with, with a fair amount of units, but they are going to struggle, as you saw there, and you're going to have to do a lot of flanking, a lot of micromanaging, skirmishing, and things like that to actually come out ahead. And as you'll see, in a lot of your fights, you're going to have massive casualties on both sides because your units for most of the game are going to be those very lightly armored types and they are going to, uh, to, to do a great deal of damage to the enemy, they're going to cause fear, but these wolf hunters have a fairly low defense, no armor to speak of, and so they're going to, uh, going to take a lot of losses. So a lot of your campaign as Dunlin is going to be managing um, managing those those retraining facilities, getting your units back to where they can be retrained and resupplied to the front. Because again, you can win battles against the United Kingdom, but the problem is they can outproduce you. They're a much richer nation right on your border. And if you don't knock out their production centers, you're going to have to fight uh, battle after battle, and you're just going to be worn down. So we'll talk more about that in the campaign guide video, but for now, let's focus on just the unit side of things. So let's start with the cavalry because those options again are fairly limited. Your native cav is these Dunlendish horsemen, riders of the Eisenmarch, and another unit that we didn't see in the battlefield are these Eisenmarch guard. These are available in the same settlement where you train riders of the Eisenmarch, which is going to mean again that they're very rare. This is a bodyguard unit, which means that when you train it, which you can only do at the highest level of military development, uh, you will be getting a family member in addition to uh, this small cav unit. Now these guys are not armor piercing. They're essentially a mounted version of your uh, your regular bodyguard here, the chieftain's guard. But they don't have uh, they don't have the armor piercing effect, and they don't have spears for a great charge either. 
So they are going to be um, a little weaker. They've got you know very small unit sizes. They're not my go-to unit. I'd much prefer to have these Chieftain's Guardsmen uh, who are going to be effective against armor. And yes, they're a foot uh, bodyguard unit, but they're going to be, I, I think, more effective overall than these guys. So in Dunfreca, I would most of the time go for Riders of the Eisenmarch. The exception might be if I really wanted a family member and for some reason I really wanted him to be mobile, like maybe I was leading a, an all-cavalry raid somewhere uh, just to, to smash an enemy territory or to distract uh, an enemy army. Uh, a couple of other cav units you get uh, are Vassal Riders. These are actually going to come online fairly early for you. Uh, these are available in Rohan. So as you do your natural expansion, which is going to be against your, your Rohan enemy to the east, you're going to come into possession of uh, cities like the Hornburg and Edoras. And if you build those up to the highest tier uh, of military development, you will have Vassal Riders. These are fairly worth it. Uh, they are kind of like an upgraded version of your Dunlandish Horsemen in a sense. Um, they have slightly more men per unit. They have the ability to uh, throw spears. They do have a missile attack. Um, it's a bit better than yours, as a matter of fact, for your Dunlandish Horsemen. And they have better armor overall, better better defense. So they're going to be um, going to be a really good unit to have uh, in your arsenal. So definitely definitely get get these guys in at least one of your uh, Rohan settlements, probably Edoras, because that's the place where you can uh, we can build everything since it's a chief city. This unit here, Shadow Riders, is only available if you convert to the Cult. And so Dunland is one of four factions on the map that map that can do this. This brings big changes to your roster, however, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Suffice it to say that for the most part, the cult is going to get you uh, more expensive, but much better armed units. They're typically going to have better morale and more staying power than your native troops. Um, so Shadow Riders, definitely a good unit, devastating charge, great uh, great defense. So they're going to uh, to just cut through your enemies uh, and, and come out on the other side with much less damage than you're used to. Okay, so that's the Cav. Now, in terms of uh, Siege weapons, you only get one, and this is only available, again, if you go Cultic. And this is a Ballista unit. Now, this is not a reason to go Cultic on its own, um, because Ballistas are not that useful, arguably. Uh, they can certainly do damage on the battlefield, but I would almost always prefer to have another melee unit or another cavalry unit rather than a Siege weapon that's, that's going to be fairly immobile. Uh, but if you have one... Uh, you know, in, in a roving siege army, that can be useful so that you can batter down enemy walls without having to wait uh, to, to build other siege equipment of your own. Otherwise, let's go to the infantry here. Now, at the first tier, uh, we saw tribal spearmen in that battle. These guys are, um, are notable mostly in that they have throwing spears, which is, which is interesting for a tier one melee unit. These are not skirmishers, uh, but they have a, a couple of throwing spears, which is great. Uh, just make sure they're set to fire at will, and they're going to do a surprising amount of damage as enemies approach. Your other tier one unit is a skirmisher type, and these guys, as you can tell, also have a missile attack, which is the same as, uh, as your tribal spears, but they have more of them. So they've got more javelins, they're going to be faster, they're going to be better... Uh, I guess, better equipped to run around the battlefield and... Uh, throw spears into the enemy's back. That said, I tend not to train too many Dunlidge Huntsmen simply because you have lots of other spear-throwing capable units, uh, like at Tier 2, your Dunlidge Axemen. So these guys, throwing spears as well, they're a bit more robust than your tribal spears, uh, but they also benefit from the war cry ability. So this is another strength of Dunlins. A lot of your units uh, can war cry in addition to throwing your spears, but this does introduce a bit of a complication because you have to decide when you're going to war cry or whether you're going to let your let your guys throw javelins. You can't do both. And if you war cry, there's a timer on it where you get 30 seconds uh, for your uh, your unit to have better attack. So if you just war cry as soon as you can. Um, you may be running out the timer if you're just going to let them sit and throw spears for the, you know, the next 20 seconds. So the timing of that um, is something you do have to play with. 
Other units at tier two are going to be Dunlitish Bowmen. Again, I would I would tend to go with archers rather than rather than skirmishers. These guys do have their place, especially in an early army. Uh, but but again, you've got lots of other skirmish options, so I tend to go for those instead. Dunlitish Bowmen. Um, this is the only archer unit you get for a long time, and so they are going to be the one the one that you train. Fortunately, they like the vast majority of your troops are incredibly cheap. So this is your great advantage. You're going to be having uh, very damaging battles. Most of the time you're going to be taking a lot of losses unless you can break the enemy very quickly with that uh, combined fear uh, and charge and war cry and javelins and everything like that. If you can get a quick route, then you can take very few losses. But in some battles, like the one we just saw, that's not possible and you're going to have to retrain a lot. Fortunately, again, your units are super cheap to retrain. You've got the population growth to handle it, so you should be all good. So I, I like to take four or so units of Dunlinish Bowmen and, um, and you know aim at the enemy archers, essentially. That's kind of what they're for. Another notable unit, um, let's see, we already saw this at Tier 2. Another notable unit is the Tribal Pikes. This is Tier 3, but this is uh, an extremely helpful unit. Uh, tribal Pikes... Uh, are not something that you want to train a ton of simply because their defense is fairly low and they're going to take a lot of losses from missiles and, um, and, and even in melee for, against certain units. But you want to have, let's say, one or two in an army, especially if you expect to be fighting cavalry. Now, if you're going up against the United Kingdom, I would take maybe you know one or just two uh, because you, there's going to be the odd um, enemy general or knights of Dol Amroth or something like that. For the most part, though, the United Kingdom is heavily infantry focused but in the early game when you're fighting Rohan you want maybe four or more units of these in a stack they're going to be very effective if the enemy uh, comes into melee with you and um, and you don't necessarily want them on the front line either you want them kind of in the back and that battle you saw uh, I had these guys in the back line again because I didn't want them to get shot up by missiles I wanted them to choose when they were going to engage so I waited for the enemy calf to hit my line and then rushed these guys in and they made quick work of them. So that's how you want to play it even as Rohan. Rohan is not going to always charge its cavalry foolishly into your front line. So you want to have your pikes kind of in the back uh, ready to respond to enemy threats. Uh, let's see, another tier 3 unit is Wolf Hunters. Again, we saw these guys in the battle. They are great. Uh, I love them, but they are uh, vulnerable to lots of different things. They're vulnerable to missiles. They're vulnerable to uh, charges from cav. They're vulnerable in melee uh, against numerically superior units and there's 60 men in a unit here so although they they do scare the enemy uh, and they do have war cry and they do have javelins again you have to decide how you're going to use them. The game will often deploy them automatically in the front line and again I think that is a mistake. I want to have these guys maybe near the uh, near the front line in the in a second rank let's say probably on the flanks. I like to have at least two units in an army but maybe more like four and then you can sort of balance them out one on each flank uh, and then uh, and, and then sort of sweep them around where they're going to be most effective let's see other native troop types are going to include axes of the wolf we saw one of these these are the highest level unit you can train uh, when you are uh, sort of following the ways of darkness which is your initial alignment as opposed to the shadow cult um, and so these guys are, are very handy they, uh, they allow you to get some armor piercing with those two-handed axes, and they can war cry. There's no fear effect. And again, they suffer the same types of vulnerabilities as the wolf hunters. Um, so you're going to have to keep them back from the front until you are ready to throw them in. Uh, and then, of course, you've got your bodyguard. We've said enough about them already. Let's see. Other native troop types uh, would include warhounds. This is something that, um, that gives you yet another fear effect. They frighten the nearby enemy, not just infantry like the wolf hunters do, uh, but, but all enemies. Uh, I tend to not train these too much. They're quite expensive in the campaign, uh, and they can get killed quite easily. So you do have to micromanage them a little bit. Uh, but they do have the advantage of being able to stop charges. Uh, so if you time it right, you can release the hounds into an enemy charge and really uh, tie them up. So that charge is going to be a lot less effective. Okay, I think that covers your native troop roster for the most part. There are, however, some other units that you can train through specialization buildings. And these would include your Dunlending Hillmen, 
uh, and which we did see in the battle, and your Dunlandish elite pikemen, which we did not. So the, the hillmen are uh, armor-piercing, war cry, scary, uh, against infantry at any rate. Uh, again, they do have a shield, uh, but they're they're so uh, weak on defense that, uh, like like some of the other units, axes of the wolf or the wolf hunters, I do prefer to keep these guys back from the front line. So what you'll find is Dunland is, you don't have much to have a front line. You don't have a line that lasts for very long. The front line is probably going to be Dunlandish axemen because they've got the best defense. They got a shield. They got throwing spears. You're typically okay with these guys receiving a charge. And they're going to be screened by, you know, maybe your archers, maybe a few skirmish units. Um, but then you're going to rush out your heavy hitters uh, and your scary units to cause some damage. These guys are available uh, in your homelands only um, at, at a specialization building. But these guys are more widely available. Dunlandish Elite Pikemen you can make pretty much anywhere that is a military-focused place. This does not have to be in your homeland, so you can train these in the middle of Rohan if you want, which is kind of nice. Uh, they have more of a defense than your tribal pikes, which is, uh, which is very good, a very notable difference in that defense. 16 uh, default defense with no experience, of course, on the tribal pikes versus 28 for the elite pikemen. They do have smaller unit sizes, but they also have a shield, so that's going to mean they're much better defending against arrows. So specialization building only, but these guys are quite a bit worth it. Um, again, you're going to want to limit these perhaps to those engagements in which you expect to face cavalry, of course. That's primarily what they're intended to do. Uh, but they do have armor, they've got a shield, and they've got decent morale, so they're going to be in a better, uh, a better position at the end of the battle than your tribal pikes will be. Um, other units from your native roster, I think that's actually all of it. So now we need to talk about the cultic switch. So you have the option of, uh, of switching your roster to an extent, and what that means is you lose some of your upper tier units, but you gain other options. So for example, you would lose the ability to train axes of the wolf if you build enough of the uh, shadow temples and cultic shrines and so forth. You would lose the ability to train higher tier stuff like axes of the wolf, but you'd keep your specialization building units like your, your hillmen and your elite pikes. Um, you would gain these other cultic units including orcs. So let's talk about the Manish cultic units and then we'll, we'll go over to the orcish side. So cultists, um, I would not rate these terribly highly. They do have a role in Dunland, uh, arguably because they help maintain the morale of nearby units by chanting. Um, you again have seen that some of these units lack morale. They're going to take a lot of losses if it's in a drawn out battle. So you might want to have one of these units maybe to help keep those guys fighting. I typically don't um, but but that might be an option. Maybe I should give that more of a try than I have in the past. There are some other units that are going to be more more typical and, and others that are more specific to certain places when you've converted to the cult. Um, this is an example of the latter. Grand's men, these guys are trainable only in Barad e Den. So this is going to be a very long way before you can get these guys. If you do conquer all the way into Mordor, which actually isn't too far. If you've already taken over Rohan, it's not too far away. Then you would get these uh, huge and frightening mail-clad warriors who wield hammers to shatter the ranks of their foes. So these guys are effective against armor. They do have a shield. They've got excellent defense, excellent armor. They've got good morale, and they frighten the nearby enemy infantry. So this makes up, to some extent, for the lack of, of say, your armor-piercing axes of the wolf. Again, they're very limited to where you can train them, uh, but it's a nice bonus for going Celtic if you manage to get all the way over to Mordor. More common, though, are going to be these units, Swords of the Shadow, Axes of the Shadow, Spears of the Shadow, and, uh, and Shadow Riders. So these are going to be kind of like your typical roster. Some of these will re require you to build certain cultic buildings, um, but for the most part, this is, is kind of the basic stuff. So these guys, Swords of the Shadow, are very heavily armored, a great frontline unit for you, as well as Spears of the Shadow, more defensive. Axes of the Shadow are kind of like your Axes of the Wolf, but they have no war cry. Uh, they, they don't have as, as many vulnerabilities either, but they're going to be, um, going to be a, bit, uh, a bit slower on the kill, potentially, than the, than the Axes of the Wolf. And then Shadow Riders are an excellent, excellent uh, cavalry unit, as we have already said. So basically what you're going to be getting for your main cultic roster is all of a sudden a front line that acts like a very, if you will, typical 
um, faction. You're going to have your spears for staying power, your swords for kind of all-rounder abilities, and your axes for heavy hitting with some very heavy mail-clad cavalry for dealing that thunderous charge. You do have a few other special units in addition to these kind of basic troops, and, and these depend on where you conquer. So we've already said that if you get into Mordor, you can get Gronn's men. If you go into Dwarven territory as the cult, you can get stone cutters. This is a two-handed sword unit, which is very rare in the mod. Uh, good morale, very well armored, a powerful charge, great defense for, for a, a unit that has no shield, and they've got a very respectable attack as well. Now, going against the dwarves is something that you could actually do as Dunlin, uh, because Dunlin does start fairly close to Moria. You could go up uh, within a few turns, and attack the dwarves, and Moria would be kind of a decent place to consider taking. Um, it'd be an interesting campaign at any rate, because then you'd have access to the Anduin Vales really early. You'd go down and, and potentially even attack Lorien, although that might be uh, uh, quite difficult to do. But this, is, this would be your reward. If you do take Lorien, or any other elven settlement, uh, you would get Bows of the Shadow at the highest tier of military development. So this is a, um, a higher tier archer unit for you. Which, uh, which is worth considering. Uh, again, attacking the elves is, is almost always a bad idea, but Dunland might have a decent chance of it. Um, you'd probably want lots of armor-piercing stuff. You'd want lots of fear-causing stuff. You'd want to bring you know, your, your, uh, your ranged units, your javelins, to try to deal as much damage to those multiple hit-point elven units. But if you could pull it off, bows of the shadow are kind of nice. So these guys have an axe, a two-handed axe, in addition to their bows, so it gives you a great deal of ranged capability, much higher than your native archers, by the way, so 13 missile attack for these guys, as opposed to 5 for your Dunlendish bowmen. And then, if, if uh, you want them to charge into the enemy uh, from the back or from the flank, they have a two-handed axe uh, to do that as well. So that's, a, that's sort of a great unit for you. Now, th the other thing we haven't talked about is the orcish element of the cultic roster. Dunland also begins with an, uh, with an orcish settlement in very close proximity. And if you take this place over and switch to the cult, again by building enough cultic temples, you can train orcs out of that orc hold. It starts right to the northeast of your capital. We'll look at it more in the campaign video. So you, if you go that route, you would get these uh, cheap orc units at tier 1, so orc raiders and snaga hunters. Um, you would get also... Orc Hunters, which is uh, an upgrade of the Snaga in a sense. They get spears for a backup weapon, a bit better uh, a bit better morale and defense and so on. Uh, you would get an Orc Band, which is um, sort of more dedicated spear and shield unit, although they're not, they're not particularly good against riders, so don't be fooled by that. Uh, and most notably, you get a couple of units that, that, that are very important for you if you go the Orcish route. Orcish Blades are only available to Dunland. Not even a Dunabar can train uh, these guys. So they have a war cry, they've got a decent attack, uh, but they're kind of vulnerable. So this is a very Dunlanding style orc unit, if that makes sense, uh, in that they can war cry and they're sort of a uh, charge them in and hope they do well, but they're going to take a lot of losses kind of unit. More important for you, I would argue, is these, the orc champions. They also can war cry, uh, but they also are armor piercing. So they're going to be effective against armor. They're going to have a good charge. They've got decent uh, defense and armor on their own. So this makes up again for that loss of these axes of the wolf and some of your other higher tier units. So really the prizes are probably going to be the York champions and Snaga hunters are decent garrison. But honestly, the advantage of going cultic and training orc units for a Dunabar is that you get a lot of cheap garrison troops. But Dunland doesn't have that problem. Dunland gets lots of cheap garrison troops in its native roster already. So this low tier stuff is not going to be very exciting for you, except potentially the fact that you get units with uh, much larger unit sizes. Um, but really, orc champions is what you're going to want to, to aim for ultimately. Last couple of units available to Dunland are some of your um, uh, vassal units. And actually, there may only be one of these that we haven't considered yet, and that would be the Vassal Archers. So this is not a cultic-dependent unit, uh, but this is similar in some ways to the, um, what is it, the Vassal Riders. 
in that you get these just by conquering certain territories, whether you are cultic or not. So if you are uh, going into Rohan, you get vassal riders, but if you go into Harad, you get vassal archers. Now, that is quite a far uh, distance uh, for Dunland, uh, but it is a, a very good unit, actually. So the missile attack is a bit higher than what you would expect from your Dunlandish archers, but your other stats are notably higher. So you're going to have a better defense, a better charge. These guys have decent armor, uh, and they don't have as bad morale as your Dunlandish Bowmen. Same unit size. They can also use Flaming Missiles, which is another morale uh, hit on the enemy. So this is an interesting unit. Um, I have never been in a position to train Vassal Archers, but it does make me curious about, um, about going down to Harad, maybe taking out Umbar, and seeing what you could train. You'd get your specialization building stuff, so you could get elite pikemen down there. Uh, you'd get the first couple of years of your native, uh, first couple tiers of your native military units, so you'd get your b basic stuff like your tribal spears, your Dullandish axemen, uh, your, uh, your Dullandish horsemen. And you'd also get some native stuff in addition to these vassal archers. So that could make an interesting migration style campaign, uh, as I've seen some people talk about on the Fourth Age Discord. So. At any rate, I hope this has provided you with some thoughts about the roster and the potential uh, for Dunland. It's a very interesting faction. It's kind of a go-for-broke faction. They start off with a decent amount of territory um, and, and, and a decent amount of armies, but you really have to get the ball rolling and make knockout gains early against your enemies so you can, uh, so you can win. But the, along the way, you're going to take some great losses, but you're going to have some great epic fights as well. So join me for upcoming videos. We are going to be looking at the campaign side for Dunland in addition to the battlefield, and I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, take care, everybody.